tonight's event is co-sponsored by Harvard University's Conservation Innovation Forum and the Government Innovators Network at Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Our moderator is James Levitt, Director of the Program on Conservation Innovation at the Harvard Forest and a Fellow in the Department of Planning and Urban Forum at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Jim will be starting us off today. Good morning. It is a beautiful, beautiful spray in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The lacks are just beginning to bloom. The flowering trees are out. It's it's just gorgeous. And we have in the newspaper this morning a reminder of the age in which we live. There is a report out. Um, I believe John Holdren from the White House helped to author a report that uh, details the impact of climate change as we speak. This is something that's in the future. It's something which is upon now and will intensify in the century to come. We are able now to look forward fairly clearly to higher temperatures, more days over uh, degrees. We're able to look forward to higher sea levels to intense weather uh, incidents, uh, storms, nor'easters, what have you, and higher levels of, of rainfall per incident. Uh, it's going to change the way that we can work not only in New England, but everywhere in the world. One that it will address uh, with, with great impact is the effectiveness of our conservation strategy. The way that we protect habitat, the way that we protect land, the way that we protect fresh resources, the way that we protect marine resources. We are very fortunate to have with us today a CEO that has been working on understanding how, in the context of this epoching change, we invest our conservation dollars. Results in mobile results that are likely to uh, impact over a very long planning horizon, 100 years or more. First guest will be Abby Weinberg from the Open Space Institute. She will be followed by Andy Fenton, Director of Conservation Programs for the Conservancy in Massachusetts, and then Tom Lautzenheiser. Audubon's Central and Western Regional Scientist, who has been working on the most recent release of Losing Ground, which is Mass Audubon's trademark mark report on uh, conservation in, in the Commonwealth. The two have been working together uh, in collaborative fashion for some to better understand and apply resiliency theory as it is Urging from scientific labs and from practitioners, and we are very, very happy to have them. We are also very, very happy to have all of you. Right now, we have something like 127 participants online for this call, which I think is a record for this particular series of webinars. We're delighted that the people who have registered come from something like 10 nations and 33 states in the United States. And as as this uh, as these become increasingly prominent, we we hope you will direct uh, your friends and your professional colleagues as we continue to discuss this over time. So, that brief introduction. Let me introduce Abigail Weinberg. Abby is um, is who has been working on these issues as a scientist and a practitioner. Uh, for uh, for most of the uh, 21st century, she um, graduate of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and head at the Open Space Institute. Abby, I don't know exactly how many years, but um, larger than I can count on one hand. Uh, <laughs> Both hands, Jim. Both hands. Okay, there you go. Uh, <laughs> I have. Uh, I've given Abby a little bit of warning, but Abby, can you tell us just a little bit about how you became interested in these topics and how you've 
uh, come to be able to apply them in your work. Yeah, thanks, Jim, so much for this introduction and opportunity. Um, my career and professional development have really been driven by a desire to find ways to inspire humans towards a more beneficial relationship with nature, to find that symbiosis. Um, to that end, I, I focused on economics in undergrad, classics degree, and then went to Yale uh, for forest management I mentioned. And simply put, I think climate change really is the result of an imbalance in our relationship with nature. So if you read the report that um, Jim is referring to, uh, this relationship arguably is on its way towards divorce. Climate change has largely been framed as an issue of carbon emissions, and from perspective, land conservation can often seem less relevant. Yet you see how wetland conservation reduces flooding damage to families and to homes, you realize that there's really a critical role for land conservation in one of the most issues facing our world ever. <laughs> From a very practical perspective, land conservation needs to engage in climate change in order to stay relevant. More foundations, federal and state agencies require that we consider climate. And no one wants to spend money on, on scarce dollars for protection on land that's going to be underwater. The question is, as I see it, is how as a community focused on land conservation can we adapt and address climate change? So the Space Institute, we are a regional organization. We work across the entire eastern U.S. And it's really our responsibility to help um, inform other organizations working within that region. We play a unique role capital from foundations, regranting it for science-driven land conservation. And because of that, we really are in a position to provide guidance to other land conservations on a big issue like climate change. So we want to um, provide some framing for really the, the more detailed conversation that's going to be offered by Andy and Tom. So let's understand where in this large, uh, really systemic issue of climate change that we are, are starting out. Where, what are we going to talk about in this hour together, or hour and a half? And um, what I want to do is sort of from the, the three main areas where land conservation is extremely relevant. So this reduction in climate change impact. Legislation can play a key role through protection of large blocks of forest and also oceanographic protection of, of reefs to sequester carbon as well as restoration of these areas. There's a critical role that we can play there. Is that land conservation can reduce our vulnerability to climate change impacts, essentially a preparedness, take flooding and drought level rise and of species ne necessitate a response by land trust. But the third thing that I'm actually that we're going to spend today talking about is about how we invest scarce conservation dollars in the face of so much uncertainty. So much of the science focused on how things are going to change. This has been a very challenging top for land conservation, which is permanent in the topic of our webinar today. And the good is, is that there is new science uh, that offers a very, very compelling approach for how to address this, this issue. So we'll start with a definition of resilience. It has become a very popular rallying cry, and it is used in many, many different ways. We're talking about resilience of ecological communities here, finding a way to measure their ability at a site level measure its ability to bounce back or renew in the face of disturbance. We disturbances will be increasing, as Jim just described, so the critical factor for finding places that can continue to function, logical processes will continue regardless of the change in climate. At the spectrum, there's vulnerability, which you see here such as these habitat vulnerability assessments group like, groups like NatureServe have taken a, a real leadership 
to prole on and to understand how habitats and species might migrate, manage for those uncertainties. For permanent conservation, we need to know what is the most likely to adapt or to be resilient in the face of these changes. We're fortunate that um, very recently, 2012, TNC's Eastern Science Division, led by Mark Anderson, produced a report based on over a decade of research. This work is supported by the Doris Duke Foundation. And the report acknowledges the unpredictability of climate change, but it does not integrate any climate models. It is an attempt to predict how much hotter it will get or, or, or how much wetter. It focuses on enduring features of the landscape, such as geology and landforms. It's a broad biodiversity lens that can complement a species-based approach. fortunate to have Andy Finton with us today, providing an overview of the science. He was involved in the development of this science and is leading the way on integrating this data for conservation in Massachusetts. Andy and Tom have been working to apply the science in an evolution, in an evaluation of development patterns in Massachusetts, and Tom will be talking about the results of that study, which will be released in June. That work has been done with a grant from OSI as part of our resilience Landscapes Initiative. This initiative is active across 20 eastern states. We pay capital grants to demonstrate the permanent protection of resilient sites as identified through this science, this TN science, along with catalyst grants for projects that demonstrate the application of resilient science to conservation planning and applied research. We've made seven grants to date, we, and we will be releasing a formal request for proposals later this month for Room 2 in New England. If you sign up for, that, for information about uh, that request for proposals, those links are available on the resource page for this webinar. Our goal is to provide guidance to land conservation organizations across this broad region on how to integrate the new and evolving science on climate change for land conservation. And the presentations today give one example of, how, of some great work that's being done. I just want to turn it back to Jim. Thank you very much, Abby. That was a great introduction. I'm going to introduce Andy Fenton, who actually is sitting right next to me in the room in Cambridge. And uh, Andy's going to discuss uh, a bit of the scientific underpinnings of this work and how it can be used in the field. Um, Andy, I think that the ball in your court. Great. I'll take the ball. Well, thank you, Jim, and the entire team I'm sitting with here in Cambridge. Thanks, Abby, for that great introduction. I'm going to start where Abby left off, talking about the importance of ecological resilience, and then deeper into the science behind how we identify sites to use from a conservation perspective in the context of climate change. In the spirit of the innovation series, I want to point out two key innovations that I will refer to in this resilient science throughout this presentation. The resilient sites can be defined by landscape complexity and connectivity, and that a resilient network of sites is defined by physical settings or characteristics of a site that are enduring, as Abby mentioned, and are drivers of biodiversity both historically, currently, and into a changing future. Moment while I switch slides. There we go. So uh, as, as Jim mentioned, the, the new uh, U.S. National Climate Assessment has just been put out. Really active pages in communicating the impacts and changes that we're going to see in the climate. So. Very briefly, and for context, as Jim mentioned, we're seeing changes in temperature, changes in precipitation regimes, and an increase in frequency and severity of extreme weather events. So how can we help our systems and species cope with and adapt to these changes? Well, one strategy, as Abby pointed out, is to 
identify and conserve resilient places, resilient sites. There's a lot of good and related definitions of resilience. Abby talked about the, um, the capacity for renewal. The, I like the ability to recover from disturbance where, again, uh, forcing what Abby said, resilient sites have a large capacity to adapt. They're dynamic, they will change. They maintain options and alternatives for species and ecosystems. And importantly, they sustain function and diversity over time. As we mentioned, Mike at the Nature Conservancy, who is the science director for the entire East Coast portion of the U.S., had, with his team developed a resilience analysis for sites across that large geography. And his goal was, Mark Anderson's goal was to um, identify resilient places in the context of climate change to help provide a tool for the conservation community that allows us to invest wisely and protect places that will support a diversity of species, ecosystems, and processes into the future. The, the, um, the report that Abby and I are both showing the cover of, all the data and some, some scientific publications based on this topic are all available at the Nature Conservancy's Conservation Gateway site, and the links will be posted on the Conservation Innovation site after this presentation. To get the ball rolling, to simplify to its core the, the key components that define resilient sites, landscape complexity and landscape connectivity are the two main ingredients. So, for instance, if you're sitting in this landscape as a bird, a beetle, a bobcat, or a tree, a little there, um, the question is how many different landforms or microclimates can you find in the area surrounding where you're sitting or standing in this landscape, and how easy is it for you to get to them? That's the core of the resilience analysis. What options do you have, and can you get to those options? I keep, I, I keep getting surprised by my little innovation uh, uh, marker, but uh, this, again, is one of the key innovations that Mark Anderson and to the conservation community, because these are really relatively new concepts in a, in, a, in a long field of conservation biology. Okay, so this is where I think if you're, if you're out there and you have a cup of coffee next to you, it would be great to take a sip of your coffee because this is one of my more complex slides. So, um, so pay attention here. And I'm landscape complexity and landscape connectivity. What does complexity really mean? Well, complexity really, um, how many landforms, as I mentioned, or microclimates Climates can you get to? So there's a lot of research showing that species will not be able to shift their ranges fast enough to accommodate the rapidly claim changing climate. There's another body of literature that is indicating that, that if there are options locally to species, plants and animals, that reach, so a diversity of places that they can, microclimates that they can move to locally, that this will stem many of these extinctions, and we're seeing more and more examples of this. So what are the landforms? So in a given landscape, there are cool, moist areas at the bottom of a slope, there are hot, dry areas at the top of the slope, and many areas in between. And if you're that bird or beetle or a plant species, and you like to, to live on a side slope of a mountain, but we experience extreme heat for several years or extreme drought for several years, you need a place where you can find refuge from those climate extremes. This resilience analysis, one of the key ingredients, as I mentioned, is to look at every given point on the ground and figure out how many landforms or microclimates can we find in that given area. When you look at the entire northeast United States and into maritime Canada, this is a map of what that looks like. So every point on the ground is for its landscape complexity within an area around each point. This and all others I'll show have a simple um, symbology where dark green or green is above average for this measure, this landscape comple complexity. Yellow is average for that measure and brown is below average for that measure. So green is good. 
one of the two ingredients. The second main ingredient is how well connected or permeable, I missed the slide, is, a, is, a, is, a, is the landscape around each point. So again, imagine you're a, a, a plant or animal on that red dot in the left map in Massachusetts. How well does that landscape around you support your movement to the place you need to be in the context of a changing climate? So what we see on these maps and, and air photos that there are solid forests and other natural habitats to the north and south of this point, but they're constrained to the east and west. There's a large river to the east and a railroad and road to the west. And so the bottom right map with the blue, um, the blue map is a graphic representation of how permeable or connected that point is to the landscape around it. The more blue, the better. And each in the entire landscape is then assessed for how permeable or how connected the landscape is around it. And that, that these data are mapped across the entire northeast. The, I should mention, too, that the data are now available all the way from Maritime Canada down to Florida and Alabama. All of the East Coast has been assessed for, for resistance through analysis, and all the data are available for those who want to download and, and use it. So again, a green, the green areas are highly permeable or highly connected for each point on the ground. Okay. So the, resilience, the fine resilience analysis is simply the addition of the complexity of the site with the connectivity of the site. It's the average of the two metrics. Now, Abby freaks out and says, but wait, you're missing a key point. Um, there is one more key point, so don't get comfortable quite yet. There's one more key ingredient to this. So what I want you to, you to remember here is that resilience equals complexity plus connectivity. So at each point, once again, how many landforms are around you that, that you can access and how easy is it for you to access them? But if we stop there, we would end up with a network of just really tending towards mountainous areas that have a high number of landforms and also tend to be well protected, better protected, and have a high degree of connectivity. But what we, what we really want is a representative network of resilient places that represent all settings and all different kinds of biodiversity we have in a given area. So to explain that, I turn to a sports metaphor. We all uh, think of your favorite team. In uh, Boston, I always need to show the Red Sox uh, Fenway Park and make sure everybody's engaged to show Yankee Stadium. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, pick basketball, football, soccer, whatever your favorite sport is, and think of your, your favorite team represented by the arena they play in. So these enduring features, this is the place that we'll always come back to and that supports our team over the long run. You realize that players change over time. They, they change year to year, and sometimes we like it, can't believe they traded him, can't believe they didn't. Um, and sometimes we, we don't like it, but, um, these, but it's a given, it's inevitable, and certainly over 10 to 15 to 20 years, the entire composition of our favorite teams change. And yet the, the team ideally stays resilient and functional, and the network of, of arenas or ballparks or, or um, stadiums running a league is a resilient network of places. If you prefer theater analogy, the the um, the stage is where the actors put on play. Actors can change over time, but the plays on even as actors change. So that's why we have the phrase conserving the stage or conserving the arena. The play change, the arena door, and the league stays resilient. So the same is true for ecosystems, forests, rivers, wetlands, etc. Stage is the place that is enduring. It's the physical setting. And through Mark Anderson's research, he, he discovered that of all the many ways to define places or physical settings or stages, that ge the geology of a place and the elevation of a place are the key drivers of biodiversity, both in the past, historically, recently, and into the future, and into a changing future. So these are the, these are the places that will support biodiversity even as it changes. In Massachusetts, for example, in the Northeast, we have wetlands 
These three pictures show wetlands on low elevation sandy soils, well, mid elevation limestone. So again, we're, we're getting different combinations of geology and elevation and high elevation sandstone. Each of these presents different suites of plants and animals and has over millennia as they've changed and will over centuries and millennia as they change in the future. So with the map of these stages, Mark created a map. He looked at the geology and elevation classes across the Northeast and defined third of these stages or arenas or ecological settings. And the point here is that in the resilience analysis to get the final product, just compare every point to every other point. We looked at relative resilience within each of these 30 ecological settings. This is a key modification to our thinking for resilience in the context of climate change and conservation in that context. To show you what, it, to, to hammer home that last point, just in case it wasn't clear, this is one of those 30 ecological settings, and you're seeing, you're seeing the resilience scores once again, green above average, yellow average, brown below average, Average just for the low elevation, very low elevation, coarse geology, coarse sand geology. We did that for high elevation granite, mid elevation sandstone, and all the other 30. So that's how we can get the best of every representative setting or stage or arena for this regional um, resilience analysis. Now we can feel comfortable with this final product. We've combined the resilience scores. You don't see the settings embedded in here, but they're in there to know we've got resilient areas for each setting defined by complexity and connectivity. The final point I want to make that leads in Tom's presentation is that Abby mentioned the, the application of uh, OSI's innovation work to a particular project in Massachusetts where we have downscaled the regional resilience scores. It's the same process, but we've used local data finer scale data, and we've sold not to the region but to Massachusetts, just that perspective, and the result has a fine scale, fine scale data set. Now, before I turn over to, to back to Jim and Tom, I just say that it's been very fun working on these data because our phone is at the Massachusetts office of the Nature Conservancy is literally ringing a couple times a month with land trusts and state agencies who want to proactively begin to incorporate climate resilience into planning and action for land protection, for funding sources, for, for land uh, management activities. So real fun working with Abby and with Tom and with colleagues at the Nature Conservancy to bring these concepts and the actual data and identification of resilient sites into the uh, conservation arena so we can have a real tool to successfully conserve biodiversity into the future. I look forward to your questions at the end, and thanks for listening. Okay. Um, as we go to our next speaker, who is Tom Lautzenheiser, I want to remind you in the audience that you have in the lower uh, part of your screen a Q&A section where you can submit questions for the three different speakers. We will take those questions at the end. We're already starting to get a couple, and I'm sure that you have many questions among the many of you, almost 150 of you online right now. So please feel free to submit them, and I will use a little editorial uh, discretion and, and present them to the speakers at the end of Tom's presentation. So now we turn to Tom Lautzenheiser. Uh, Tom, as I said before, is the Central and Western Regional Scientist for Mass Audubon, which is is the oldest Audubon Society operating in the world today. Uh, he has his degree in biology and environmental studies from Tufts University and holds master's in natural resource planning and ecological planning from the University of Vermont. He is the author of a, a report called Losing Ground. I think this is the, the fourth uh, iteration of Losing Ground, Tom. You can correct me. It is the fifth edition. The fifth edition, um, and uh, it, I think this report incorporates a lot of thinking that Andy and Abby have brought to the table. So Tom, let me let you take it away. Thank you, Jim. 
And this is just a, uh, you know, one application of the resilience data to really lead uh, strategic thinking in conservation in Massachusetts. Uh, typically, as, as Abby and Andy have both said, you know, we've the conservation community has has looked at uh, traditional data sets like um, biodiverse areas. Or, uh, large landscape blocks, for example, areas to prioritize for conservation. And the resilience data set is a new perspective, a different lens to add to the mix of uh, conservation land prioritization. Uh, ARMS is part of the Lound uh, publication series, which Mabon has put out uh, in a Earlier intervals. Um, this is the fifth edition. First one was published in 1987, and uh, this series of publications documents how development affects affected uh, intervalues in Massachusetts. Uh, the first the edition in 1987 that over 100,000 acres of land were lost to development between, in the five between 1981 and 1986. Uh, we've documented up to 44 acres a day of uh, open space were lost to development uh, through the 90s um, into, into the, to the 2000s. Um, this most recent Edition uh, will be published in June or released in June, and we've discovered that uh, the economic recession has uh, directly slowed down development pressures in the Commonwealth. Uh, we're now at a, at a rate of natural estimate value of approximately 13 acres per day, whereas the pace of land conservation in that in that time is now approaching uh, closer to. To 30 to 40 acres per day. So it's a real conservation success story uh, that we're that we're documenting in losing ground. And losing ground focuses on planning, community planning for resilience. Uh, so we have looked at where resilient lands are are being affected and protected, and we try to lay out a roadmap for uh, further conservation. And using this data, so Andy, to the uh, downscaled Massachusetts climate change resilience data set, I won't uh, go into this too much. I just want to point out that our analysis was focusing, uh, using the same color scheme that Andy referred to. We really focused on how development has impacted the green areas on this map. Uh, Massachusetts is is really essentially two states with a densely developed uh, greater Boston area and, and the um, lessly developed western part of the state uh, with the area of the Quabbin Reservoir being kind of a key uh, landscape feature of the state. And you can add that uh, going up and get the little pointer it is right here, a uh, central, highly resilient part of the landscape. Uh, these editions of Losing Ground have based uh, the analysis on a data set that's been produced by the state's Office of Geographic Information, or MassGIS. This has been based on uh, a photo interpretation and, uh, and land cover mapping. Uh, was not available to us uh, for the edition. Uh, there has been no statewide comprehensive uh, um, aerial photo set. So we turned to a uh, Landsat data set to develop our land change uh, analysis. So SAT is a, working with SAT is a, quite a bit different than working with aerial photos, uh, satellites flying at about 700 miles from the of the Earth. Uh, 
So this is a picture of southeast Massachusetts around the Cape Cod Canal area. Uh, a true color image of, of the landscape there. Uh, what is the satellite seeing? Well, um, what the site sees is, looks something more like this. Which is these dots in the uh, per chart is a reflectance or return uh, one snap dot, uh, one type pass. Satellite pass over the region approximately once every 16 days. A new data point is added. So this is the hundreds of data points uh, sweeping from the uh, early 80s through uh, 2013. You can see there's a bit of noise here. Uh, and then down in around 2004, there's a pretty abrupt change uh, that you can see in this in this band. That indicates a land use change, and then it reser resumes back around 2006 uh, to actually a different um, different use as well. And this little chart, which represents a single year, all of the data points for each day are uh, distributed here. So the uh, points that are in blue are from the earlier part of the series. Points that are in red are from the later part of the series. You can see most of the blue points are, are in the lower part of the curve. Some of the red redder points or more recent points are up here in the upper part of the curve. So this is what the uh, Landsat analysis has done. Uh, our group at we've worked with a group at BU to analyze these data sets, and they have a model that uh, can pick out very accurately when something has changed. So. Uh, we have we've fitted a curve to the data in the early the data set Bob Long, and then uh, the curve now representing a, a different use. You can see change as well in the annual curves. So we've uh, had a set of reference data points that we have met, and each of the curves can be matched with curves from those known red sets. So out this area is a forest, and this area is a cranberry bog. Um, so the computer uh, model can assign cover types to, to these different returns. So within that model, we've generated a, a land use cover map, and importantly, uh, essentially have a, a, a continuous change map uh, from 2005 to 2013. Uh, the Landsat model was not that great at identifying or classifying areas where there are a few number of reset data points. So it, it uh, importantly, uh, did the change occurred, but was not able to detect what the new changed or the new changed category was in certain parts of the state. For example, there's a swath uh, representing tornado damage in uh, the 2011 tornado that passed through Western Massachusetts uh, from Springfield to Milton. So. Uh, to uh, backfill some of those areas uh, to, with uh, air photo interpretation to uh, uh, really be confident that um, our land use data set was complete and our land change data set was accurate. So we did this, uh, this most recent, uh, 2013 land use land for map. Uh, we have simple classification with seven classes of uh, commercial, high density, low density residential, uh, forest, wet water, cranberry bog, and open. And we, uh, we've identified these with
where all of the uh, which occurred between these categories from 2005 through 2013. The map uh, it was originally shown in the original edition of Lose Mount, uh, 1987. This shows this shows land development between 1981 and 1986. Land development is focused in uh, eastern Massachusetts. Um, as he said, for the most recent map that we've developed um, based on our land use change analysis. Uh, so we see a similar pattern of development uh, through every, basically every edition of losing ground. Um, haven't, haven't changed a whole lot. Development being actually in the band around the 495 belt. This is a uh, Interstate 495. And the on this map represent the um, Massachusetts uh, Bay Transit Authority commuter rail lines around Greater Boston. So now we're seeing is, is the most dense, most uh, rapidly developing communities are, are essentially at the nodes of the commuter rail and uh, around the outer Beltway Highway of Boston, with concentrations of development around the Greater Springfield area here in western Massachusetts. So how does development affect mass, uh, resilient land? Well, we overlaid uh, land analysis with the green, highly resilient um, land area. And what we see is that development has really impacted resilient land most heavily in the eastern part of the state. And then for this is that, that a lot of eastern Massachusetts communities did not have uh, a lot of resilient land left in their landscape. So if there was any development in that area, it would affect a, a large proportion of the available resilient land. So for example, the community of uh, Burlington here had one small of resilient land left in the city. Uh, and it was developed, and um, so uh, they come out as one of the highest communities in the state for loss of resilient land. Um, areas in in south of the Massachusetts Turnpike in western or central Massachusetts are, are potentially more concerning in that. Those areas um, have a lot of resilient land, so if they're showing up in a higher change category. That means uh, there were probably larger changes uh, to their to the resilient land um, proportionally. Action within resilient land, uh, somewhat opposite pattern, um, where the greater Boston area is not experiencing uh, a whole lot of land protection in resilient land, um, where we're seeing more concentration of, of resilient land protection in the North Robin, uh, central Massachusetts area, in the uh, southern Berkshire Highlands. And then importantly, I think, uh, in southeastern Massachusetts as well, uh, the southeastern Massachusetts area is interesting because that's an area that's also receiving a lot of development pressure, and there are some real um, conservation success stories with, for example, Fall River Bio Reserve, um, where which is the um, now the highest rate of. Um, land protection within resilient land in the state is here in this community of Fall River um, is really approaching build out so that uh, an important conservation that um, has, been, has been reached there, uh, conservation success in, uh, in the face of a lot of development pressure. Tom, you've got two minutes. I'll be
be right here. It's my final slide. All right. Uh, so what this does is lays out a roadmap for uh, resilience in conservation planning. Uh, this map shows essentially as of 2013 where uh, land has been protected or where it remains um, essentially available for either protection or development. And importantly, this area here, uh, south of the Robin Reservoir and the Massachusetts Turnpike, shows up as a, a um, highly uh, is a landscape that remains vulnerable to development. Uh, and some of those areas uh, have not been previously identified as conservation priorities. So this resilient land perspective um, helps the conservation community see the landscape in a new way. And hopefully we can uh, incorporate resiliency and considerations of resiliency into our conservation prioritization strategies uh, to you know, ensure that land, uh, the Massachusetts landscape remains uh, supportive of a wide range of um, biological diversity uh, that happens in the future. So with that, I will turn it back to Jim. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Tom. So we, we have had an overview. We've had a little bit of the scientific underpinnings and uh, a suggestion of how we can apply this in conservation going forward in a state or a region uh, in the United States. We have a number of questions, and I will start to go through them now, but I also want to say, everyone, that we're going to probably go on uh, past the noon hour because we've got so many questions and so much material to cover. Feel free to stay on as long as you can, but we understand if at noon Eastern time in the United States, you have to sign off and, and go in a direction. I'm going to start with a question from uh, Mary Snayakis in the United States. Hello, Mary. Uh, you ask, can resilience be enhanced or restored through management? And we'll let, uh, I think, maybe Andy, you can start with that. I'll start and then see if Tom already has thoughts. Um, I, the, the conservation community really believes the answer is yes. So a lot of um, there's a lot of inherent resilience in the places that are, were identified through the analysis that I uh, ran through, but there are still things that we can do. For instance, with salt marsh restoration, we build resilience into that salt marsh and the surrounding uplands. With forest management, we can shift. The, the density and volume of, of uh, and composition of, of trees and other story with um, with wetland management, with um, uh, removal of dams, for instance, allow a, a river to be more resilient in the face of extreme storms. So the short answer is yes, and the long answer That's no good. Jim, are you still there? I lost them. Oh, okay. So I guess I'll kind of call back in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll try that too. <laughs> that's when we ended up in a little <laughs> room to ourselves. Huh. All okay. right, hold on. <laughs> okay, bye. Hey, we're back. Uh, it says cold. No, go ahead. We're back. Uh, pardon that interruption. We lost uh, uh, a dozen people, and I'm sorry, sorry we, we became unplugged. Um, All right. Um, but let's see. The, the next question. I think I think we get cut. This is Andy. Just real quick. The short answer is yes. They're great. There are many examples, and we can improve resiliency of a place uh, through restoration and management. I, uh, this is Abby. Could I add 
to that just a moment? Please do. Please do. Thank you. Um, yeah, great question. And um, Andy, um, I, comp- I completely agree with what Andy said. And one thing I wanted to um, hone in on regarding the data is that as Andy described, data is broken up into two elements. One is uh, the complexity and these diversity of landforms and microclimates, and then the other being the connectedness. So one thing to think about is that if you're going about restoration, mean maybe reforesting some area, maybe it's a farm, you know, region, um, and uh, there's some opportunity to um, reforest some of those areas. If you can identify places that are very scoring very high for complexity, then those places, if re- if um, reconnected through the habitat, uh, the natural habitat on the landscape that is most likely going to increase the resiliency of that landscape. So that, that connectedness element is something that we can impact through restoration. I, I would completely second that, and I feel like uh, increasing the um, permeability of our built landscape to um, life movement is is going to be one of the strategies for increasing the resiliency of our of our landscape. Hey, thank you. Carly Vero asks a uh, question, will there be a Western analysis performed? And that begs a larger question, which is, uh, will TNC and other organizations perform analyses like this across the United States and in different parts of the world? Yeah, question. There is currently an effort underway to do a similar analysis in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, parts of Montana, and Northern California. But I'd have to talk to my colleague, Mark, to see if there's effort beyond that. I think largely it's based on available funding and uh, interest of Nature Conservancy and partner organizations to, to bring data and this analysis to those areas. But there is an analogous uh, uh, analogous analysis in the Pacific Northwest right now. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Day asks in the chat section of the questions, um, I haven't looked closely at the aquatic resiliency data yet, but can one comment if or how people are applying aquatic resiliency in protection and or management work? And Andy. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm in the same boat. I haven't looked closely at it. I, 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 I've seen that, and, and it's, it's based on different criteria, obviously. But I, I think it's new enough that I don't know of good examples, maybe Abby does, of people um, applying it to these kinds of conservation decisions. We have, um, thanks, Andy. We have been working on just that question um, and actually have been trying to get um, Mark Anderson to do a presentation on uh, that data because it is quite different, um, as Andy said, and I think that would be a valuable um, information for the conservation community. A couple things um, that relevant here. So um, the, the aquatic resiliency does consider some of these same concepts of connectivity and complexity. And the connectivity element often is really looking at the entire what what term the active river area. So that includes the wetlands and floodplains that are um, related to that water system and that are affected as the water you know, ebbs and flows, the, the rise and, and lowering. And so in thinking about that, um, that floodplain and those wetlands adjacent that are in the, the stream flows are critical terrestrial conservation priorities or land conservation priorities. And that's one way that we've been thinking about that um, land conservation can directly impact that resiliency of of the aquatic uh, freshwater system. Uh, Let me take the moderator's prerogative and ask uh, a larger question, which is, it seems to me like like there's still an emerging body of analysis and science, that we're in the early days of understanding how these kind of landscape analyses are going to work and connect with freshwater systems and aquatic systems and at a continental scale. I don't mean to imply that um, we're using the analysis, but the, 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 the behind this and the practice of using this 
is still emerging, is it not? not? And okay. Um, you're around, Jim. Um, you're exactly right, and we see that when we talk to our state agency partners and land trusts. In the people are including the Nature Conservancy is still figuring out the best applications. I think we started the session. Mark Anderson has been working on this analysis in various forms for more than a decade. So I think the science is is gelled quite well. I think the application is where we're still learning, and how to combine these data, as you said, with other site-specific data. I think the best the best way that I characterize it is that it's a great filter to show where our investments are going to pay off the best into the future in that these areas will support the theory and the concepts will show that these areas will support biological diversity as things change into the future. But yeah, the applications will take some some trials as we move forward. So can you comment on how uh, we're, we're able to use this new science and actually making decisions about where and what kind of uh, part of land to protect? Yeah, Jim, I, I think that um, uh, we really are at the point of, of needing to push this into practice, and I do think it is a push, and I, I, I think it's worth acknowledging the Doris Duke Creation, who supported the creation of this science, um, but also um, funded us as, um, to help push that through. And so through our capital program, we um, are really testing that. So, for example, um, both our capital and our catalyst grant program. So the two the two ways we're, we're doing that is um, we are putting – we have uh, now $12 million across the 20 states um, that we are able to put as a carrot to organizations that will can target land conservation to these resilience sites. So we – have now process for evaluating a, a specific parcel um, and its resiliency, its contribution to a larger resilient landscape. Uh, that has all been worked out, and we are actually working on some guidance materials uh, that we would distribute for, you know, how to apply this to evaluating parcels and uh, the relevance of the science. The other side is the need to help organizations in advance. We, to some extent, conservation is an opportunistic approach because we need a willing seller. If we can land uh, the most resilient land, you know, we we need to um, we can't do anything about it. So um, the question is: Is conservation planning and how does this work fit into conservation planning? So the kind of application that Mass Audon is doing, um, the kind of application we've given a grant to a small uh, land trust, Bay Paw. Regional Greenways in New Hampshire that has applied this science to their conservation plan to think about what are their parcels and how does this shift their priorities, as Tom talked about in that southern band along I-90, how do they shift their priorities around resiliency? So really in the early stages, we've just received a grant from the North Atlantic Land Conservation Cooperative to harness a lot of our learning and develop a set of guidance materials uh, for other organizations to apply it. But um, it's uh, it's um, something that we need to work on and uh, just kind of go out there and, and make some mistakes. So I want to I want to ask a couple more questions, uh, but I want to I want to add a plug uh, in here for uh, an event that's coming in October called National Workshop on Large Landscape. It will occur in Washington, D.C. at the Ronald Reagan Building on the 20th and 24th of October. And this, perhaps, many other kinds of application and scientific uh, presentations uh, come to light there. We'll have some presentations from policymakers and decision makers uh, at the state and federal levels. And I think that. Uh, I make that point now because I think that this dialogue is quite important given the challenges that we're facing and is uh, is just beginning to really uh, get to a stage where we're in earnest about how do we protect in the in the, in the era of uh, dramatic change in in the climate and and uh, conditions on the land. All right, given given that. Uh, I want to ask a question posed by Aaron Copeland. 
Uh, and asks, given much of our population lives in cities, is there a way to complete this research at the scale of cities in order to improve the resilience of our urban ecosystems? Uh, any takers? I think there is um, so, <laughs> um, it, you think other factors would really need to be considered when you're working in an urban landscape because there are vulnerabilities that go beyond an ecological analysis. We have to remember that this is really focused on um, you know natural system and, and, and the functioning of our natural systems for ecological purposes. So when you're working with the, the environment, there are so many other vulnerabilities that may impact that system that, uh, you know, just looking at alone um, probably won't give you a satisfying answer. But to the extent that um, you do have natural systems, uh, like, for example, the um, Central Park in New York, and you could understand uh, the, the complexity and opportunities for connecting the park systems in um, a more urban environment. Andy, comments on that? I, I think you said it perfectly, Abby. It's really there. There are other factors that come. There are many things one can do to the resilience of, of urban areas. Um, can be one of those inputs, especially for areas where this habitat and functional ecosystem interest with the uh, with the urban environment. You're right. There, there are many other facts and, and data to inform resilient cities as well. All right, now, there are a number of uh, more technical questions. I'm going to cover a few, but I encourage you to get in touch with uh, SI or with the Nature Conservancy in Massachusetts to further explore this. Chris Nagy asks, can you elaborate a bit more on how you measured and characterized connectivity given that it varies from species to species, location, and so on. Yeah, um, good. Well, and I, I'm happy to. I love chatting about this stuff, and could go on for longer than we have. I'll refer people who want to get a little deeper into the nuts and bolts to, to download the report where a lot of this stuff is um, is explained in further detail. The the connectivity model is not species specific, as you point out. It takes into account the uh, the ability the uh, the the need of different kinds of uh, mobility, of different kinds of animals, largely moderately mobile animals like um, reptiles and amphibians, small animals, and analyzes the landscape in that context of how easily the landscape facilitates movement of of those kinds of organisms that do need to move but um, but have a hard time with barriers. But it is a more generalized understanding of the landscape permeability in, in, with the intent to support all types of movement and processes. Animals for sure, but also other processes like pollination and um, and water movement through the landscape, etc. All right. Uh, Tom, do you want to add to that? Are you set? Yes, I'm all set with that. All right. Lindsay Shell, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And the following questions. It feels like this could be an important uh, item for species that require large blocks of protected land. Can you yeah, let me take a quick swing. This is Andy, and then I'll see if the, the other guys want to jump in. Um, one piece that I did mention, because this is, again, a, a large and complex analysis, is that a first step that Mark Anderson undertook was to look for places where there were large aggregations of these resilient pixels, races on the ground, um, to identify those as focal areas. And that, that was a concept that, that OSI has used, too, so that it naturally identifies large blocks of resilient habitat, because we do, we do know that size of habitat is also a key contributor to the resilience and long-term assistance of species and habitats. The only thing I'd add there um, it the fact that um, after the analysis was complete um, on a contract with, with the Northeast um, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, marked a, a really interesting analysis looking at, at the correlation of resilient sites with, with various species. And the correlation was strongest 
um, for uh, a lot of your smaller animals. In fact, your mobile mammals, large mammals, and all birds were least correlated with um, the results of this analysis. So it's interesting, you know, the point being that it, it, it the, the local connectivity is really looking at your ability to access or, or any point, as, as Andy clearly described earlier, you know, the, the ability for a species to access low points. And so that's playing out much more, is much more relevant for your smaller uh, animals, you know, that uh, ibians, for example, that, that aren't as mobile as your birds and your mammals. So in a way, the large, you know, the really mobile species um, and the ones often that require large and ranging areas, um, very additional connectivity analyses or even movement analyses can be, you know, more appropriate to those species. And that seems somewhat better. Yeah, good insight. I hadn't thought about that. It does. I think with that, I'm going to answer one last question. Jill Murray Dimmick asked, can you repeat the name of the conference? It's the National Workshop on Large Landscape Conservation. States are just out now for October 23rd and 24th, 2014 in Washington, D.C. For more information, you go to the website largelandscapenetwork.org. That's posted. That's also posted in the chat room. Um, but I want to thank Andy and Tom for giving us insight into really what is, what is uh, an important new frontier of conservation science that is re its way to decision makers and policy makers, and probably will continue to do so for years to come. Uh, we will be back uh, probably after the summer vacation in September to bring another set of speakers to you. But for now, we, we thank you all for your participation. We thank the presenters for their insight, and uh, we hope the day for you is as beautiful as the one is here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you very much.